what's up what's up what's up again um i'm sorry for the mediocre mic quality i'm having technical difficulties with my laptop and i do not have a pc set up put together yet it's getting there so i'm going to give that disclaimer um for the mediocre mic quality okay i'm recording this on some turtle beach headphones so it's good but it's not great okay um today we are going to do the top six books last year i did five but i read a lot of books this year so i had to make it a top six um, and there's a reason why I did that, and I'll let you know. But we're going to be doing um, the top six books that I've read in 2022. Not top six book releases that were released in 2022. Just the top six books that I read in 2022. Okay, guys? So, first, let's start off with my Goodreads stats, shall we? Let's start off with my Goodreads stats. So let me see if I can pull this up. Let me see if I can pull this up. My good read stats, y'all. I am so impressed with myself this year. So here's what we're going to do. And I'm going to read this off to you guys first. And then we will then get into the top six, okay? 2022, in the year 2022, um, I read... Um, which really the number of this is not relevant because all of these were audiobooks. I'm just letting you know. 13,159 pages, 45 books were read. My goal was set at 40. So I went five over the goal. So for 2023, I'm setting the goal at 50 because I think it's probably within reach if I just push myself. Um, Chaos Rising was the shortest book that I read this year, which was the prequel to the Edge of Collapse series, which I'll be talking about one of the books um, in this um, top six. In my top six, one of the books from this series is in my top six, but this is the prequel to that series, Chaos Rising, coming in at 129 pages. The longest book I read this year was The Toll by Neil Shusterman. This book is the longest, coming in at 625 pages. This is another book series that I'll be talking about in this top six. One of the other books is in this top six um, uh, from the Ark of the Scythe series. The average book length in 2022 was 292 pages, which is almost 300 pages. The most shelved book that um, I read this year was Scythe, which is the first one in the Ark of the Scythe series by Neil Shusterman. The least shelved book that I had read this year was called The Age of Fentanyl, um, Fentanyl, um, however you want to say it, by Brody Wamen. Um, only 182 people shelve this book, which is kind of concerning considering, um, the times that we're in and how, um, uh, severe of a problem this is becoming. And for only a hundred, like literally less than 200 people to read this book is a problem to me. Um, but it's very similar, um, from what I understand to the book Dope Sick, but this is about specifically fentanyl and, um, this author's, um, observations being a doctor on this crisis my average rating for 2022 was four stars the highest rated that i read this year um on goodreads was edge of anarchy um which is coming in at a 4.52 stars uh, that was the highest rated and by the way that one made the list so just like um the uh one last year that it came in, um, which was called, let's see, just like last year, I started off the, um, uh, with, uh, Favorite Sons by Robin y Yokum, because that one was the highest rated on Goodreads. We're going to go with that format here, and we're going to segue right into, um, this book and why this made the top six for me. Okay, um, by the way, these are in no particular order. I, with all of my top, you know, lists, I do not 
rank them. I do not rank them because it would be impossible for me to do so. <laughs> okay, so I did not rank any of these at all, um, at all, um, but they're on the list. Now, like I said, um, there was a rhyme and reason why I did top six. The reason why I had to do top six instead of top five is because I read a lot of nonfiction this year and a lot of fiction this year, and I wanted things to be even instead of uneven with five books. I wanted it to be even. I wanted to give three spots to nonfiction, three spots to fiction. So that's why we did it this way this year, okay? So, Edge of Anarchy is on my list. This is coming in on my list because of the pure suspense, the pure drama um, that was portrayed in this book Um in my December reading wrap-up for the end of the year, which is when I had read this book, I'd read this book, it was the last book I read for 2022, actually, um, in December. This was such a good way to end out the year for me, because I had read, this is the fifth book out of the series I've read so far, um, including the prequel, okay, guys? Um, this is technically... Um, a seven book series, I would c call it more like an eight book series because of the prequel. Um, but some people would call that a novella. It really just depends, um, on who you're talking to, but the edge of anarchy book is the fourth book in the edge of the official fourth book in the edge of collapse series. It's about an EMP that, um, this is what the whole story is about. It's about, an EMP that happens on Christmas Eve in America, and then what happens to the characters that we're following after that, okay, in Michigan. So, um, this is an amazing read. This particular book out of the series was is definitely my favorite so far, only because the whole story comes to a climax here. And everything that was the groundwork was being laid for in the books before this one, before the Edge of Anarchy, okay, everything finally boils over and comes to a head and a crescendo here, and people pick their sides, and um, basically all out war happens. Um, and we get to see again, like I said, where where the characters lie. Where the characters lie in this story, um, some people may not like the endings to a lot of these characters in this in this this book, but I would venture to say, based on the fact that it's the highest rated book I read this year on Goodreads, um, that a lot of people actually enjoyed the book. A lot of people enjoyed the ending, um, and it was ne to me it was necessary what happened to the characters. And, um, it was really, it did not disappoint, guys. It did not, Kyla Stone did not disappoint with this book, and that's why it has to be on this list. Because it was such an amazing ending to the whole drama and the whole feud that was going on in the town. So, like I said, I, I'm, I'm still in the process of reading the rest of the series, but this book, this book, guys... Out of all of the books that she wrote in that series so far that I've read, this is the best. This is so good. It was so good. It was worth reading all of the other books just to get to this point. That's what I'm telling you guys. It was so worth it to read all of those other books before this one just so I could read what I read in The Edge of Anarchy. So guys, 100% that had to be on my list and... It, it did not disappoint. I would totally, 100% recommend you read the Edge of Collapse series. Um, it will prepare you most likely for what looks like it's about to set, you know, what looks like it's about to take place in this country, about to be set into motion. Um, the total collapse. So you're going to want to prepare yourself and, and read those books is what I'm telling you. So um, I guess we'll start off with fiction then. The other book books that I had put on my list this year, um, one of the other books that I put on my list this year in my top six would be Thunderhead by Neil Schusterman. This is the second book in the Ark of the Scythe series, 
um, the vibes in this book were so heavy. Honestly, um, Toll was a disappointment to me. Total disappointment. I talked about that in my other um, reading wrap-ups for the year. Um, that book was a total disappointment. Scythe was good, but it wasn't fantastic. I don't know why, but it seems like with a lot of these dystopian novels, the second one is always the best. I don't know why that is, but it just is. Um, this follows, um, uh, this follows, this book follows, um, Rowan, who, um, had basically in the, like in the book description says has gone rogue, um, has, um, dropped off the map for a little bit, was rejected, um, and it, it follows him and, uh, the, the waves that he creates by, um, basically, um, going around, um, well, I don't, I don't want to spoil this book. I really don't want to spoil this. Um, h- how can I describe this book without spoiling it is the problem. Um, so Rowan has basically gone rogue after the first book. Um, something occurs to his character that basically, um, he basically can't be, um, found. He's, he's trying so hard not to be found by the authorities. Um, and he ends up calling himself Scythe Lucifer, which if you read the book, you'll understand what, why he calls himself that, um, in this book, we follow, um, Citra, um, and, um, uh, we, we follow Citra, um, and her path to officially becoming, um, a Scythe, and, and how that works, um, with, uh, Scythe Curie, um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, um, that's the best way to put it. Um, there are some new characters that come to play here. Um, a lot of new characters are introduced in the last book as well. But the reason why I have to give this one a spot on the list is because... The whole, the series as a whole is great, right? But the second book was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. We got a lot of twists and turns again, a lot of twists and turns, um, a lot of drama, um, a lot of last minute choices, decisions, thinking, um, a lot of chases, a lot of, um, just high, high, uh, stakes, suspense, action, thrilling, um, and it's just great, you know, it's just absolutely great, um, we end up finding out, um, that certain characters, um, that we thought, um, or they, they find out that characters that, um, or I guess we all find out really that characters we thought had departed were really not, and they were going to do their own thing and finding out their own thing. Um, the, um, the reason why this book is called the Thunderhead, um, you'll understand the whole AI, um, system, um, or I guess that's what I would call it, I'm not sure if that's what Neil Schusterman would call it, but I I don't know, um, it kind of reminds me of, uh, the 100 a little bit with that sort of aspect, um, there, um, the, the show, the 100, which was also a book, it kind of reminds me of that a little bit, um, but 
you'll understand why it's called that because that's what the AI system is called. But that plays the AI system plays a pretty big role in the story, which I think is also an intriguing thing because it's not technically a person. It's it's a it's a it's an AI. It's not even a character really. It's it's like a intelligence form that plays a big role in this. Um, and I will say, um, this book ended on a pretty big cliffhanger. Um, and, you know, each book, I feel like the good thing about this series is they kind of all start to, like, at the ends of every book, it does start to flow into the next one. And, and it's pretty, um, it's, it's it's a pretty smooth transition in each book, but this book had such. I, I think the characters were really at their peak in this book. Um, all of the characters. the The first book was really introducing us to these characters, right? And I think the second book really it was them at their peak, guys. Because even in the third book, the third book just did not do it for me with these characters. Okay, guys, like, I just, something about the third book just, I, I've explained this on other wrap-ups before, like I said, it just rubs me the wrong way, um, the third book. I, I just like to act like the third book doesn't exist, it's kind of like mocking Jay guys with Suzanne Collins, it's like, nobody likes to think about the third book, what, same thing with Divergent, guys, nobody likes to talk about Allegiant, nobody likes to talk about it, um, because it's just controversial to even bring it up. Uh, and that's how I feel about the toll. I was not impressed by the toll, but Thunderhead, I'm telling you, every middle book, y'all, Thunderhead, Catching Fire, Insurgent, the middle book is always the sweet spot, guys. It's always where it's at, I'm telling you. So that's how it was with this. Um, he had actually released another book this year, which I think had some short stories in it called The Gleanings. Um, I think he'd release that this year. I have not gotten a chance to take a look at that yet. I can't wait to read that. Um, honestly, that might be my next actual um, new book purchase. That'll probably be my only new book purchase for a while because you guys know me. I like purchasing used used books, but um, I, I would be willing to read that and see what that's like. But Thunderhead had to make the list. I gave it a five stars. I gave it a five stars. Now, the last fiction book that is on this top six the third book that is on this list that you know the third fiction book on this list is called on a quiet street guys 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 <laughs> listen to me just listen to me when i tell you this now i had a lot of different options in terms of um in terms of uh fiction I had a lot of different options, okay? I had read um, Shirley Jackson's book this year, that We Have Always Lived in the Castle. I read um, the one FBI um, series um, this year that I thought was really good. Um, I'd read a lot of I'd read a lot of Lucinda Berry this year, which she could have easily made it on this list. Um, but the deal is, guys, is this book by Seraphina Nova Glass was so amazing, like, it was so good, like, I'm, I'm still, like, with a lot of these books, guys, is, like, after a certain amount of time, they kind of wipe from my memory, like, I don't really remember them, not with this one, guys, not with this one, this one is phenomenal, phenomenal, it's about a suburban town, with a lot of women, okay, and, um, there's not really a lot of crime, it's not really a lot of crazy drama going on, it's not really a lot of, um, criminal activity going on, but that's what makes this book so much better, is the fact that it is such a bland, it, it, you're starting off with a bland, blank canvas here, and the way that Serafina Nova Glass just painted this canvas, um, let me just, it, it was just, guys, 
so uh, amazing. The characters, the characters individually in this book are so very flawed and so very um, thrilling. That's why this is really a thriller. It's just great. I love thrillers, guys. Um, this book is really amazing. I'd given it a five stars. Now, this um, story, I guess I'm going to read a little bit from the book description on Goodreads. Um, it says, Who wouldn't want to live in Brighton Hills? This exclusive community on the Oregon coast is the perfect mix of luxury and natural beauty. Stunning houses nestled beneath mighty Douglas firs and lush backyards roll down to the lakefront. It's the kind of place where neighbors look out for one another, sometimes a little too closely. This gives me, like, this book kind of gave me a little bit Woman in the Window vibes with the spying aspect here. And the spying aspect here is so very important to the story. Um, I don't want to spoil a lot. Of it. I really don't want to spoil it because with the thrillers, it's like you really have to really... Um, dance on eggshells about how you talk about the books because but I'm just telling you guys there's a reason there's a reason why th this book is being was being talked about um, I do believe this actually was a 2022 release um, everybody was reading this book this year rightfully so um, this is probably this is a really amazing thriller and I've read after reading this book I read some of her other thrillers Guys, this is, I think this is really, um, the, the novel she's broken out of the mold with, um, because her other books were kind of like, they're great thrillers and all, but this one really stood out to me because, um, just everything about it is great. Um, you've got the, um, not soccer mom, but she's just like the PTA mom, Cora, right? Um, and her husband, Finn, who's kind of shady as hell, um, and her, her friend Paige, um, who's kind of playing private investigator ever since something happened to her son, uh, passed away in a car crash, um, it, um, and, and it's just, uh, and a hit and run, I guess, um, so we've got Cora, the PTA mom, we've got Paige, her kind of, um, recluse, um, so, so here's how I imagine Cora is a bubbly PTA mom in this, in this story. And then Paige is the kind of, mm, like she's giving, she's giving recluse. She's giving, um, you know, uh, she's giving a very, um, what's the uh, broken, you know, um, struggling, um, she's giving, uh, Sherlock Holmes, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, she's trying to figure out what the hell happened to her son. Um, she's kind of, um, hostile, um, t towards other people during this time. Um, and then she kind of starts to loosen up a little bit, um, because she's given a purpose again to basically be, um, a private investigator for somebody else, and she feels like she's being useful and stuff, and so she starts to open up a little bit more um, later as you go on into the story, and I think the the, the three main characters here is, is just amazing, so Cora is like the bubbly one, um, and then her friend Paige, who you would totally not expect to be Cora's friend at all, just based on their totally opposite personalities here, but I guess opposite to track, and, um, she, um, Cora, the, Cora, see, that's the one thing Cora and Paige, I guess, have in common is that they like to spy on people. So Cora likes to do it because she's just nosy as hell. And then Paige likes to do it because she's, um, she's just curious and she wants to know all the dirt on everybody in town. And she thinks that it might help her catch whoever had done that to her son, um, so that's really, they have opposite motives, um, but for doing things, but at the end of the day, they really, um, I guess bond over being, um, you know, basically a stalker to everybody in the town, um, or in the, the neighborhood. Um, so, uh, blah, blah, blah. so basically, yeah, they're doing things for different motives and it says, um, I'm trying to read with um because i know 
Okay, so then the the third female character in this book is called Georgia, and she is a basically um young mother. Um, she's she's got a child, and Cora loves spying her, um, you know, spying on her through the fence every day or whatever. Because she's just like so infatuated by this young, lively woman, she she wishes she could go back in time and basically become her, and so she's living through her by spying on her every day, and so that's what Cora does, and basically, um, Cora is constantly trying to befriend her, and then George is kind of like always standoffish with her, and Cora doesn't like that because see she's friends with everybody in the town, and she's a PTA mom, and she's got to be up in everybody's business, and so she does she makes it her mission to try and somehow befriend Cora and maybe even babysit the child, and you know remember when her life was that perfect, right? So that is what um her motive is and and that's who georgia is so there's three different women here this the two pair the 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 friends that are already friends and then you've got this new neighbor that moved in who you know core is trying so hard to be friends with this woman and it's just not working and through her persistence through wanting to try and find out why she's basically getting rejected so hard by this woman this young mother every single time she gets um that's where the story takes a turn and that's when we start to find out the backstory of what is really going on in that house um and that's when things get dramatic and and i'm gonna leave it there so you guys can pick up on it and read it for yourself trust me guys this is there's a reason why everybody was reading this this year um it was published it is saying it was published in may of this year um, so this was one hell of a book, um, and I gave it a five stars. It had to make the list. It just had to, because you know me, I love me a good thriller. Um, and see, that's the thing. Thrillers, dystopians are my life, are my life, guys. Thrillers, dystopians, mysteries, and sometimes the occasional paranormal romance or horror is, is my jam. So this just has had to make the list it had to make the list guys it just had to so now we'll be entering the non-fiction portion of this video um this year i had read a lot of non-fiction like a lot of non-fiction guys i like to learn things um, I never used to like nonfiction, but I found my niche is like kind of political nonfiction as well as um, true stories that I'm interested in. So I did read a lot of nonfiction this year. Honestly, it was kind of tricky to it was kind of tricky to figure out which ones were gonna go on this list because, there were a lot of great nonfiction books that I read this year, but these are the three that had to go on my list. So let's start off with the least political one on this list. Um, so, um, yeah, let's just start off with the least political one on this list. The least political one on this list is called The Mon Monsanto Papers by Carrie Gillum. Now... This book is based on a true story. It's it follows a true story, follows the true story of Lee Johnson, who had won the lawsuit um, with um, um, had won the lawsuit over on Monsanto. Um, basically, what had happened was um, he was a um, landscaper um, for the district, his school district, and um, he had a mishap with a backpack sprayer, which had all the Roundup in it, and he had major health issues after the backpacks had broke, um, and I mean, it's literally one of the biggest cases in modern history, um, this guy is an absolute legend, his lawyers are absolute legends, um, and Carrie Gillum is an absolute legend for writing this book, um, and you know, this book, um, 
this book is really sad. Um, it's really sad how America, um, is not doing anything or saying anything or speaking up really about, um, these issues with our food supply, these issues with the people that are involved in our food supply. And it's really a shame that, um, more attention is not brought to the subject. Um, that's why the, I love this book because it's shining a light on what had happened, um, to him and, um, to many others as well. Um, his case was the most severe. Um, but there were, there were other victims of, of, of Monsanto as well. Um, and, and why, again, why we let, um, the people who literally created Agent Orange, um, aid in the process of, um, you know, growing our food and, and, and manufacturing pesticide is beyond me, is beyond me. And I still don't understand why America allows this to this day. Um, but it's, it's ignorance guys at this point, when we have solid evidence, um, clearly laid out in this book, how Monsanto knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing guys. Um, and how the, the, literally I've been researching this company for quite some time. I've been infatuated with this, um, this, you know, subject matter ever since I was little, um, the disappearing of the bees because of them. Um, and the, the disappearing of the, the butterflies and how they would terrorize farmers, um, over, over nonsense guys. Um, I am so disappointed that, you know, this country refuses to acknowledge how our food is literally poison. Um, and nobody cares. Nobody cares. It is killing people. Nobody cares. Um, about the farmers, nobody cares about the landscapers, um, nobody cares, nobody cares, guys, and it's, and it's really disappointing, um, and it's, and it's sad, it's like, why, what bothers me so much about this country is the hypocrisy, guys, more than anything else, I think, the hypocrisy is what bothers me the most, and the, uh, the blatant hypocrisy of, oh, you know, green this, green that, you know, greenwashing everything, but yet they have no problems with companies like Monsanto now uh, merged with Bayer, um, you know, manufacturing toxic chemicals, toxic seeds, toxic pesticide, um, and, and the fact that it's killing off bees, it's killing off butterflies on record, you know, and, and it's killing off humans, more importantly. Um, you know, the fact that this is all on record and, and people still continue to to look the other way, turn the other cheek, um, is, is actually, is crazy to me when everyone's like, oh, greenness, oh, climate change this, climate change that, well, guys, it's like, put your money where your mouth is, you know what I mean, it, I don't understand, see, that's the one thing I don't understand about Americans, is they say one thing, and they're doing the totally opposite thing, and that's why this book is so important, um, because, it brings awareness to the story, and I'm, I've am i been recommending this book to everyone I know, um, everyone I know, and it's made such an impact on me, and, and so has Lee Johnson himself as a person, has made such an impact on me, it's such an inspiration, and it so, sounds so cheesy, but it's such an inspirational story, um, it really is, and, and it's such a... Um, his, he, he's made such a difference, guys, such a difference. Um, and I'll, I'll tell a little story here about what had happened to me while I was reading this book. While I was reading this book, I was actually painting a mural at my old school. And while I was doing that mural, I was listening to this book. And one of the days that I was painting, and after listening to this book, I was so emotional so emotional over the story because this is just so wrong that somebody that that Lee Johnson had to go through this is so wrong that he had to go through this and it's so wrong that nothing no demands are being made um for these these toxic seeds and pesticides to be regulated um but 
I was I was an absolute mess reading this book. Um, very similar to how I was reading Radium Girls. It bothered me at the core that companies could get away with literally poisoning human lives. And, you know, humans with children and, and families and lives. And it bothered me so deeply listening to this book. I, I continued to read it, but it, it just, the story itself bothered me so much. The corruption, the nonchalance of really of the Monsanto lawyers over this. And it bothered me deeply. It bothered me deeply to the point where I literally cried. I, I cried for quite some time um, over this. And it was so difficult to keep myself honestly together while I was painting this mural because it was so emotional um, listening to this. And one of, the, one of the days that I had finished painting, I had went outside and saw that my school was using, my old school was using a organic um, landscaping company. I can't tell you how that was such a sign from the Lord um, to me. And that was such a sign to show that his suffering did not go, um, it, it did not go, um, you know, it, it did not happen for just no reason, guys. Um, as, as sad as it is, you know, his suffering took place and it didn't take place for no reason. It wasn't in vain because other um, schools, other farms because of this man because of lee johnson have now switched over and made the switch to organic because of him and because of this story and for a lot of people it was the last straw you know where there was a last straw instead of instead of using that toxic crap on their gardens or whatever the hell else they were ever using that for, and I'm not even sure why they were using it to begin with, but this was the last straw for a lot of consumers. And why should I give money to a company that's doing this to humans and, and the environment? So, um, this was an extremely impactful book for me. Um, Lee Johnson is an absolute warrior. Um, his his lawyers, this author. Um, recently, there was a documentary that had come out um, to Canada. Um, I've been I've been trying to see if there's a way to watch it um, in America um, because I think if this was released to Americans, um, and there might be a reason why they can't release it to Americans, probably for legal reasons, I'm guessing. Um, but if they were to release that documentary to Americans. I feel like that would have to wake up a lot of people because, you know, Americans, a lot of Americans are not going to sit here and read or even listen to this book, um, but they would watch a documentary on it. And so I've been trying to find a way um, to, you know, watch this in the U.S., but I can't find a way right now. I'm, I'm still... Um, I'll try and ask Lee Johnson again if there's another way to... Um, watch this, but it's called Into the Weeds, and they've even gotten Instagram, um, Lee Johnson has been talking about this a lot, um, on his Instagram as well, he's in it, um, because it's his story, and it's, I, I honestly, I'm dying to watch this thing, but I haven't been able to watch it in the U.S. because it was released to Canadians, but I would totally, guys, if I watch this documentary, I, and I was able to do um, that in the United States, I would be more than willing to do a re review on it. I would be more than willing to give you my thoughts and opinions on it because I think this is something that really, I do believe Americans need to sit down and watch this because this is getting out of control, it's getting out of hand, it's getting out of pocket um, with Monsanto. And um, it's, it's quite frankly amazing to me how Americans still want to refuse um, to acknowledge, um, what's really going on here and, and the, the ultimate agenda of this, um, you know, and, and how that affects them personally, it, it bothers me guys, but, um, at least, at least some 
um, this story has impacted some and has affected some and change is being made slowly. Um, but you know, it's just an amazing story, guys. I'm telling you, um, and it's a sad story, and you will probably cry because this is just terrible to listen to about another human being and what they had to go through. But it was a story that I'm glad was told, and I'm glad because I knew about this case a few years ago, um, and even people um, that I knew personally denied denied uh, any that Monsanto did anything wrong, which really deeply bothers me now. Knowing Lee Johnson, um, it it really bothers me um, that and knowing the story now, hearing that then really bothers me even more now. Um, the denial, and it really does. It really gets under my skin. And because this is this is 100% without a shadow of a doubt, if they actually did their research, they would know for a fact that what they were saying about Monsanto was a lie. Monsanto 100% knew what they were doing. That's what makes it so sick and demonic um, is because they knew exactly what the hell they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing. And the way they went about it, too, after they had gotten found out is, is even more disgusting and disturbing to me. Um, but to say that you know, it's a load of, you know, BS really pisses me off and, and Americans really need to get their act together and need to stop, um, you know, the denial. They really need to stop that. But, you know, I had known about this case. And like I said, people that I knew personally really talked bad about this, this case. And they never followed up on it afterwards, I guess, because if they did, they would know how wrong they were. And, and, and they honestly ought to give an apology for what they had said. Um, but this Lee Johnson had won millions of dollars. Um, uh, you know, he had won the, it was the biggest case. Um, one of the biggest cases, like I said, in recent history, and it's one of the most important cases in recent history. And I think everybody should know about this, and that's why I'm telling you, you should go read the Monsanto Papers by Carrie Gillum. So, I know that was a mouthful, guys, but you guys really need to hear that, okay? Um, I talked about the book more in depth on, again, one of my wrap-ups earlier in the year, so you guys can go find that and watch that. Um, now we're going to be getting into the more political, um, section of the nonfiction. Okay. So there are two on here that made the list and, um, let's just go with the more, uh, moderate view on, uh, what's going on in this country right now. And you may be like moderate, you may be like moderate Joe Biden and Obama are on the front cover. Well, let me just tell you something. Peter Schweizer. Peter Schweizer. You better get to learn that name, guys. You better get to learn that name. Because this man, I don't know if he has a crystal ball. I don't know what the hell type information he had. But, guys, this man, this man right here, you want to talk about journalism. Journalism. When it comes to American politics, this man knows his shit. I'm telling you right now. Every American, every American needs to read this book, Secret Empires by Peter Schweizer. I gave it a five stars. Five stars. And by the way, I don't know if I said, but you know, Monsanto Papers got a five star as well. Um, Peter Schweizer's Secret Empires. Peter Schweizer, Secret Empires. I'm going to say it one more time. Peter Schweizer, Secret Empires, guys. How the American political class hides corruption and enriches family and friends. The American princelings, guys. The American princelings, guys. This friggin' book is so relevant right now. It is so relevant. This came out in 2018. It's been four plus years now. And this book is more relevant now than it ever was four years ago. More relevant now than it ever was when it first came out. This man... Guys, the fact that he... He went in on all of these politicians. Let me just list off who I know was in this book and who I remember to be in this book. 
Barack Obama, Mitch McConnell, who is a Republican. All right, don't you play with me. Okay, he's a Republican. Okay, Joe Biden, Jared Kushner, and Trump. And Trump, yes, Trump is in this book. John Kerry, and I do believe, I do believe, I could be wrong, I could be wrong, but I remember Nancy Pelosi being in this book. Now, I could be wrong, but um, if she was not, she, she really ought to have been. The corruption was explained so well, and it was laid out perfectly, perfectly in this book. Everything about this book was laid out perfectly. He had also wrote Clinton Cash, which was also amazing, but not as amazing as this one. This one was... He had, he had went in on everybody, guys. In 2018, guys, he had brought up Mitch McConnell and his CCP wife and how they're getting money. And, and see, this is one um, thing that... Uh, Dave, um, uh, Doug, um, the Doug and Dave show, oh, uh, what's his name? Doug, um, oh, jeez, I always forget his freaking last name, guys. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I'm hitting a brick wall with this guy's name right now. The Doug and Dave intel, the... The, the Common Sense Show, the guy from the Common Sense Show, I'm trying to remember his name. Um, geez, man. What is the guy's name? Give me a minute, guys. I've got to find out his name. <laughs> I always forget his last name. Um, Um, or is it Dave? I keep forgetting. Dave Hodges. Okay, I always forget the guy's name. Jeez. But Dave Hodges talks about Mitch McConnell and his CCP wife all the time. Guys, this man, Peter Schweizer, went in went so deep on the the ports and all of this stuff and the CCP connections in 2018, guys. He went deep on the Ukraine-Hunter Biden connection, the CCP connection. He went so deep on that in 2018. This was before the Biden crime family phrase was ever coined by Rudy Giuliani. This was before... Rudy Giuliani ever coined that term, guys. Peter Schweizer was writing about stuff that Fox News has only started talking about a few years ago, okay? the All of this stuff, all of this stuff that Peter Schweizer wrote about the Joe Biden family, the, the Biden crime family, he did not coin that term. Rudy Giuliani coined that term in 2020 when the laptop was released. Peter Schweizer might as well have created that whole, the the whole term. He might as, I mean, to me, he's like the father of the, the Biden crime family connections here. He's the father of explaining it perfectly. Guys, he wrote this book in 2018. In 2018, and he goes so in detail and in depth on the Biden connection to Ukraine in 2018 before the laptop was even released. See, I don't know what information he had, guys. I don't know what information he had, but he didn't even need the laptop to know what was going on with the Biden family four years ago. Okay, in 2018, two years before, the, when he was vice president. Um, no, he wasn't vice president still. No, what I meant to say is before the 2020 race, he was able to gauge what was going on. 
So he had either some, I don't know, he either had some really good sources or he sit, he did some really good digging. But I think he had sources for this book. I, I could be wrong, but the fact that he was able to describe this in detail and in perfect detail and he didn't miss one detail is, is amazing to me. The Jared Kushner DJT fiasco, he explains, for those of you that believe Peter Schweizer is, is somehow... A, you know, a total um, Republican, a total uh, Donald Trump lover. He makes it very clear that there were some there were some shady things going on with the Trump business, with certain buildings, certain foreign buildings, certain deals that he had with foreign countries. And this was while he was still president, guys. While Donald Trump was still president, this book was released. And he talks about Jared Kushner and Jared Kushner's financial problems and how this relates back to Donald Trump and his constant keeping of Jared around all the time, making him feel special. Um, he, he does such a good job describing and then, and, and then Obama and all of his relations and all of this stuff. Guys, he does an amazing job. And, and here's what the, basically the whole premise of the book is. The focus, the main focus of this book is how politicians evade evade um, basically the law or certain requirements through giving and funneling their money to their significant others, to their siblings, or to their own children. That is what this whole book is about. And he talks about the princelings and how um, how men in China operate and other foreign countries, eastern countries operate and how it's a similar deal and how they're doing under deals under the table um, with other companies or corporations while all the while their parents are in a state of power and position and in office and how basically if that was to be exposed that they were doing direct deals um, with these people to the public, how that would totally tarnish their image and they would never be able to step foot into any office again. Okay? Well, Americans do the same thing over here. It's just very under the table. And a lot of regular average everyday citizens have no idea this is even going on and how this is all going on under their noses. And basically... It talks about how Joe Biden was funneling money to to his son, to his brother, and, and that's what this book talks about. This book also talks about Mitch McConnell and his wife and the issue with her and the major uh, national security issue with her. Um, it goes into detail about John Kerry and, and his relations um, with, with uh, different oil companies and stuff like that, different... Um, you know, it just, it all culminates and it all becomes very clear in this book, how the, the, the method of how they're able to evade the law and Nancy does it. That's why Nancy guys, Nancy Pelosi and her husband, everybody knows, everybody knows these stocks, the trading, the insider trading guys. Her husband, her husband is the one in control of all of that. She doesn't even try and hide it through whatever, you know, niece or whatever, you know, uh, if she, her, her son is involved as well, actually, come to think of it. Her son is involved as well. He does the deals as well. He's very similar to Hunter Biden. If you don't know Nancy Pelosi's son, very similar in that way to, to Hunter Biden, but this series, um, this, not series, this, 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 um, basically collection of politicians that are known to do this on record and the proof to back it up and, and all of the receipts, um, everybody needs to read this. Everybody needs to read this. Um, everybody in America needs to read this because again, with the denial it's right there in front of your face. This book was published in 2018, 2018 before the Biden crime family was ever discussed. 
and 2018 before the 2020 general elections, uh, but before um, Trump left office. So this book was written, and, and if you guys think that he's biased in any way, like I said, let me make this clear. Donald Trump is a Republican, and so is Mitch McConnell. They are both in this book. So you liberals are going to be wanting to read this as well. And educate yourself on your heroes. And let me tell you something. I've never once claimed Donald Trump, and I've never once claimed Mitch McConnell. I've said it a million times. They're both slimy scumballs, scumbags, okay? I will never, ever get behind them, ever, ever, to lead our nation, never. I will never, ever, ever acknowledge them as the best option we have because they're not the best option we have. And neither is Joe Biden, neither is John Kerry, and neither is Nancy Pelosi. So you guys have got to, got to read this book. I'm telling you. The money laundering that's going on is, is right in front of our faces, right under our noses. And the proof is in the pudding. Read this book. The final book that I put on this list, which is going to be controversial for some that I put this on the top six, but I don't really care. It's my channel. Okay. Technocracy. The Hard Road to World Order. This is your guidebook, guys. From now on, see, this is your guidebook for the future. I rated this a five stars. See, this is your guidebook for the future events that are about to take place in this country. This book was also published in 2021, believe 2018, I want to say 2018, um, this goes in, I, I believe 2018, I'll correct myself if I'm wrong, um, this book, again, by Patrick M. Wood, um, extremely relevant, extremely accurate, um, pinpoint accuracy, um, again, like Peter Schweizer, uh, pinpoint accuracy, he goes through the history, Peter M. Wood goes through the history of all these globalist elite agendas, um, and, and how they play into, uh, how they play a role into, um, average everyday, uh, day-to-day -day living, and he describes, um, some of his concerns with crypto, with cars in the future, with how society is run, the, the very foundation, the very um, groundwork for society and how these people are wanting to take it apart um, and, and put it back together again. And um, it, it's very uh, relevant. Again, it's very relevant, even though it was published a few, uh, you know, probably almost four years ago. Um, it's extremely relevant. Um, everyone should read this book. Everyone should read this book. You're going to need this to understand what we're about to enter into. Um, many people call this the fourth turning. Many people are calling this the one in 200 or one, one, uh, 150 year event, um, where everything about society is going to change before your eyes. And there's going to be nothing you can do to stop this. You can't stop. In a, I, I was about to say innovation, but you can't stop technological advances that the elites are hell bent on putting into place. Um, there's a reason why they call it technocracy guys. And let me actually give you the hardcore definition of what a technocracy is, because some people are like, they've never even heard that before that word before. And it's so important to understand what it is. Um, Technocracy, the government or control of society or industry by an elite of technical experts. Okay, so the Elon Musks, guys, the Elon Musks, the Bill Gates of the world, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the um, all of these uh, so-called experts in the field, technologically speaking, um, basically working in tandem with the government to form some sort of government based on um, basically a, a total surveillance state, total control over the population. Um, it, it's such an amazing, it was such an amazing read. It was such an amazing book. Um,
I um and strongly encourage strongly encourage everyone to read this. I do. I strongly encourage it. Um there were even a few things here that in this book that I never really thought about or pondered before and they ended up coming into play later while I was reading this and it ended up sparking um some thoughts in my mind about what's going on with this crypto stuff and and everything else that he was talking about. Uh, it, it was such an amazing, informative read that you guys just have to. It's your guidebook going into the future, and, and trust me, you're going to need this book for 2023. You're going to need it. So that is the end of the top six books that I read for the first time in 2022. Um, I know this was pretty long for only six books, but I want to really give... I wanted to really give an in-depth look at each book so you'd be more inclined to read it and make it a part of your favorites. So um, that is all for today. Till next time. Bye, guys.